Broadcasting from the Unshackled Studios in Melbourne, this is Wilms Front, brought to you by theunshackled.net. Now here's Tim Wilms. So this time last year, the whole of Australia was under a, a coronavirus pandemic lockdown uh, during the first wave. And this was when the federal government introduced job keeper and uh, job seeker to support businesses who were forced to close and workers who had uh, no work at that time and could be permanently unemployed. Uh, both these programs were extremely expensive and shattered the Morrison government's of projected much surplus. I think my guess there that that's their trading that you can hear. I'll just mute them for a moment. Uh, so one year later, we have uh, both uh, job keeper and job seeker ending. Uh, no state in Australia is under a lockdown or severe restriction. So life here is as normal as it has been for a long time. The predictions of pending economic doom that were made including on this program, have not come to fruition with Australia now technically out of recession and unemployment now trending downwards. Now, why is this so? Well, my guest tonight uh, is going to shed some light on why that's the case. Uh, Andrew Abraham is an experienced global financial markets analyst and commentator. He is the CEO of Australian House and Home and Australian investment property supplier. He has appeared as a financial market expert on CNBC, and it's my pleasure to welcome him uh, to Wilmsfront live from uh, Chengdu in China. Andrew, welcome to the show. Pleasure to be here, Tim. Uh, I should have reminded you uh, during my introduction that the audience could still hear you, so they found, uh, they, they heard you, is that trades you were doing in that, that yeah. sort of bubble noise? <laughs> Yeah, my my apologies for that. I guess that's the life of a, a finance trader. It's well, e e even though the markets throughout the world they trade during business days, but uh, obviously there's all different time zones around the world. Some markets open. Yeah, no. Look, uh, the cryptocurrency market's twenty four seven actually, so it never sleeps, never sleeps at all. But um, yeah, it keeps you uh, on on your toes, so to speak. Very interesting. Uh, de de definitely no bank holidays when it comes to crypto. No. <laughs> wallet holidays. Mm, yeah, that's quite interesting. And uh, the, the markets have been, you know, really crazy the last six months, um, all markets in particular. But um, there's a lot of lessons that could have been learned from the 2008 financial crisis. And I think a lot of people have you know, misread uh, a lot of the financial information that has been broadcast, especially throughout the US, um, you know, and other OECD countries. And, um, you know, a lot of opportunities have passed by, good opportunities to say the least that were as well. Now, even though you're living in China uh, at the moment, as uh, your accent uh, gives away, you're uh, an Australian, uh, you're born and raised here, uh, a few uh, people were asking the, or the origins of your, of your surname, uh, Abraham, which is Armenian. Correct, yeah. Half, I'm half Armenian, half Australian, but I'm Australian, obviously, so. Very happy uh, Armenian uh, Australians in, in prominent positions at the moment. Most obvious, uh, Gladys Berejiklian, the Premier of, of New South Wales. There's also uh, Federal Liberal MP Tim Wilson and former Treasurer Joe Hockey uh, is also Armenian as well. Mm. Yeah, they, uh, they've, I think they've been in politics for some time as well, correct? Yes, even though it's a, it's a small uh, central uh, Eurasian country, a former uh, Soviet socialist uh, republic, it, has a, it, it still maintained its uh, unique culture and it's uh, desperate is all over the world. Mm. Yeah, there's, a, there's actually more Armenians outside of Armenia than inside. So <laughs> that, that, that wouldn't, that wouldn't surprise me. Mm. Yeah. Especially in Australia and, and uh, the US. 
Uh, now, as I said in my introduction, there's been a, a lot of predictions of, of doom, economic doom this, this past year, but uh, we're in a situation in Australia where our, our GDP figures have uh, recovered. Uh, we had in the uh, September 20 quarter uh, quarterly growth of 3.4%, uh, then in the December quarter, 3.1%. We've just had the job numbers out with unemployment trending downwards from 5.8 to 5.6. Of course, that covers everyone who's basically got, what is it now, or a paid work, doesn't count underemployment, that sort of thing. But that's always been the case with the, the unemployment numbers. And I've interviewed uh, uh, John Adams and uh, Martin North on this program who have been uh, predicting for quite a while the uh, the the housing bubble would would burst and the, the the stock market would crash but it just it hasn't happened and it i don't see it happening there's obviously we have easy money at the the moment but uh, what's what's your reading of what of the economic situation at the moment look um first and foremost i mean i don't want to bag bag people you know and it's like but i mean when i mean a guy like john adams when you've got you know, his title of his YouTube channel saying the total destruction of Australia. I mean, you know, it's a bit extreme, um, you know, and I think that, you know, in, especially in, when it comes to economics and finance, right, opinions don't matter. What matters is data. And essentially when something happens in the past with very similar economic circumstances and conditions, you can bet your bottom dollar there's a high probability the same thing will happen again. Now, look, in 2008, when the financial crisis hit, I lost a bit of money. And, you know, I don't, you know, I, I don't, you know, hide it or, um, you know, I, I think it's, you know, every, everything's a learning curve. And um, I was of the same opinion that, oh, you know, the financial crisis is here, you know, we should sell everything and uh, the whole financial markets are going to deteriorate and crash. and. Uh, then the Federal Reserve decided to step in and do something called quantitative easing. Now, that's not really uh, standard monetary policy or it's something that, you know, is normally is left to emergency circumstances. However, um, that sort of gave us a very good window looking back into what would happen during corona coronavirus. And I've managed to profit off it quite well because, not because I'm intelligent or, you know, I'm hyper hypersensitive to, you know, extreme announcements or, you know, I'm aware of what's going on just because, you know, I know I, I see the same thing happening all over again. You know, we're going to go into ever more level, ever, ever more increasing levels of debt and they're going to have to pump the markets up. And that's what they've been doing. Now, I'm not saying that the end result is going to be fantastic. I don't believe it will. But to say that the markets are going to crash when in 2008 they didn't do that at all, then your opinion is far off what the data shows. Now, I'm an adherent to the Austrian school of economics, which uh, the Austrian cycle of the, the business the theory, the the reason why the, the economy uh, surges then crashes is because of things such as as, as QE, that uh, the which is, well, in layman's term, is uh, reserve banks printing money, which uh, leads to capital miss appropriation and uh, when the, the 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 bubble or the the, the money uh, stops printing that's when the the economy should rightfully crash and then there's a, a reset which the aim is capital is is bet is more appropriately uh, distributed but the most common form of uh, QE bubbles is in housing and despite the predictions of housing prices collapsing in Australia that's another thing uh, ha house prices are surging uh, in even in Melbourne despite what we went through uh, all throughout uh, uh, 2020 the only places uh, which uh, uh, which uh, property is declining is where uh, a lot of uh, universities are near and also the CBD as well. So say near Monash University in Clayton in Melbourne, obviously the CBD with a lot of people working from home and up near uh, Bandura, a lot of those units have significantly declined in value for obvious reasons. But overall, uh, especially in the other states, states and territories, property prices are up. 
Yeah, look, I mean, let me put a simple question to, to all people that are listening, you know. When interest rates get dropped to zero and the, the cost of borrowing money is cheap, what did we really expect to happen? I mean, it's, you know, when, when, when you make the cost of borrowing virtually zero, it's going to drive a massive explosion in asset prices, and it has. And, you know, what a lot of people, like I, I was watching a, um, a property commentator the other day on his Facebook channel, and he was saying, oh, yeah, but, you know, the market's going to correct and the market's coming off well. And my comment to him was, okay, so you're going to fight the Reserve Bank of Australia, are you? So your predictions are better than, uh, are going to fight, uh, are, are more worthy than the Reserve Bank uh, issuing quantitative easing to the tune of billion dollars and billions of dollars a month. You know, and obviously I got no comment back because you can't really argue with that point at all. Um, and, you know, that's what's driving this, this, this uh, housing um, explosion. The, the thing about uh, the Austrian cycle of the uh, Austrian cycle of the Austrian theory of the business cycle is what because as you said uh, the reason the economy is not crashing the housing bubble bursting is because the Reserve Bank just continues to print money why can't they just keep what's stopping them from just doing that in perpetuity I mean obviously uh, if a reserve bank suddenly goes from interest rates to near zero to uh, close to 20%, like during the, the, the 1991 Paul Keating recession we had to have, it, can it just, can they just keep printing money indefinitely and not ever having a correction? Well, you know, if you care about the uh, accounts of your government in terms of your national debt, then you know, you really cannot just continue QE in, into perpetuity uh, because what people don't realise is that every dollar that's printed is actually debt which you and me owe with interest. So for governments, and the other thing as well, if, the, if governments want to destroy their dollar, then that's a very good way to do it. I mean, QE is generally used for emergency uses. Now, on the flip side, I think the, 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 reserve, the way the Reserve Bank is acting, because just so your viewers know, the Reserve Bank of Australia has never embarked on QE before. This is the first time in modern history that they've embarked on quantitative easing and the purpose was for propping the economy up during coronavirus. Now, in the United States, they embarked on it during the GFC in 2008 um, and they had QE1, QE2, QE3. Now, I would say in the United States, they've got QE infinity because the amount of money that they're printing in the US is ridiculous. My outlook on the United States is not very good when it comes to uh, a lot of the metrics that people use to measure the state of an economy. Um, I think the US economy is cratering. But on the flip side, the Australian economy is doing really, really well. And a lot of it has to do with our main exports, which are commodities. And commodity prices always go up in times of crisis. So there's a lot of interconnected pieces to this puzzle. But just to get back to your original statement, I, I agree you can't do QE in, in, to infinity without consequence. Um, and I don't think the Reserve Bank is planning on doing that. And I don't think that they they really are going to increase the amount that they're doing it by every month. I know that uh, <laughs> the uh, Treasurer, the, the way that he describes QE is that the Reserve Bank is injecting liquidity into the, the market. That's his, his spin. He, he has all sorts of uh, economic uh, spin words, such as the Australian economy is, is very uh, resilient. I'll, I'll give it to him. He's a good uh, sp uh, spin master. But you're, actually, you're, you're absolutely right that uh, Australia has, doesn't have a, a history of QE like what well, the, the US seems to have been a constant QE since the uh, global financial uh, crisis and we well, are talking about uh, Tim Wilson before he's one of the uh, MPs is actually raising the the alarm about that we can't just have QE forever it ca it, it can be argued that well it, it, the coronavirus pandemic is an emergency you would use uh, QE uh, but as as you said the Australian economy is doing well to a lot of our, our surprise especially since it 
we lived in such a a, a global a, a global dependent trade world, and we went from a fully integrated uh, a gl- a globalization partner uh, pre uh, March twenty twenty to them becoming Fortress Australia. We still are Fortress Australia. And uh, this is why I think that uh, there's not much appetite amongst the Australian populace to open up the international borders again because, well, we've been Fortress Australia for a year and as a, a life is as normal as it was uh, pre-COVID. Mm. Look, I mean, at some stage, uh, the, I, I, I personally believe the opening up of Australia will probably coincide with a reduction in QE. Um, you know, I think that that sort of is common sense. You know, we need the the stimulus uh, for the economy to keep turning over um, until we can have you know things return to normal. And uh, you know, let's let's not you know be. Uh, uh, let let me rephrase. Um, you know, the fact that Australia is closed in a lot of respects is hurting the economy. You know, it's just that the government is embarked on this QE, which is propping up, prop, propping things up. So, you know, I, I I do look forward to the time where Australia can reopen for business, um, and I honestly believe that Australia is going to do the best out of every other OECD country in in its recovery. Obviously, the most <laughs> sign of the, the the pandemic having a, a negative impact on Australia is our, as our CBDs because of office workers uh, for a lot of 2020 working from home and a lot of them wanting to, to stay uh, working from home. And obviously the Melbourne CBD, that's where you'll see most of the, the four lease signs and, and uh, vacancies. But I live out in suburban Melbourne and obviously that's where people most Melbournians actually live, even though they may work in the city and travel to the city for events. And I go to the the various the shopping strips and shopping centres where I live. You don't see any of those for lease signs, anything like that. Or the all all, all the pubs that were forced to close uh, because of COVID, they're all back in business. It's like they were never forced to to close. So where people actually live in Australia, they don't see a empty tumbleweed main streets like there there is somewhat in the CBDs, particularly Melbourne. Well, my a, good, a guy I went to uni with, he um he's the head of commercial leasing uh, for what's the company called? Not Jones Lang LaSalle, oh, Colliers. He's, he's the head of commercial leasing for Colliers, and I rang him up at about uh, about June last year, and I said, "Look, what's going on?" You know, I said, "He said it's stuff." You know, he said it's stuff. He said, you know, commercial commercial properties under pressure. That's no uh, guess, you know, because people had companies had to vacate, staff couldn't come to work. Um, a lot of multinational companies which have their operations based in CBDs of, around mm-hmm. around Australia, um, you know, they had to totally restructure their businesses for the purposes of COVID. So um, it's no surprise that that is the area that's feeling the pinch the most. Just going on that term, restructure, because obviously there were businesses that went under during COVID, but uh, there were quite a few that went under that were probably going to go under anyway. I noticed where I live, some of the the, the, the shops that went f- empty, they were on their, their last legs anyway, and they're, be- they're going to be leased by, by somebody else. But the, uh, with a lot of people just going back to the working from home like i don't i don't i don't see why there should be this big push to if people can do the the job just as well from home and that works for them uh then surely they should be allowed to but obviously it's going to be a a restructuring and painful if our cbds and the, the restaurants and other hospitalities the coffee houses eh, they're not going to get the the foot traffic anymore and when there's a restructure a redistribution in the economy it's it's painful for a few look a hundred percent um you know there's going to be winners and losers with every dynamic shift that occurs whether it be from a virus or 
from unfortunate other unfortunate circumstances. Um, but you know, I think Australia is pretty resilient. Uh, you know, we uh, our economy is doing quite well, and uh, you know, I think on the most part, like you did mention, well, if people stay out of the CBD, then a lot of these businesses might suffer, and that could be true to an extent. Um, but you know, I'll, I'll give you a perfect example. Like in China, uh, when this virus hit, um, and even even one year after, which is now when the worst sort of past, people's spending habits are completely changed. And I think the same is in Australia. Like if you're if you don't have an online presence now, you're losing a lot of customers. You know, people. Why would you know people are starting to understand the convenience of ordering something on your phone and letting it arrive at your doorstep, you know? So I think that whilst what you say is true, there's going to be less foot traffic in the city. I think businesses are smart enough to understand that there are other ways that they're able to attract those customers. Yes, that's another aspect. Uh, (laughs) They they won't disappear completely, but there'll be significantly less of them. and I would argue that if you didn't have a significant online uh, presence before March uh, t- 2020, uh, you'd ob- obviously had been making the, the wrong investments because I think during all the 2010s, growing your, your e-commerce uh, presence would be important. And uh, we are seeing in uh, Australia the delivery services becoming more efficient, including uh, Australia Post, uh, so parcels are arriving much quicker when you order them on online. And obviously, if there's more of a volume of online orders, click and collect, then it's the 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 cost uh, per order it, uh, for the uh, delivery uh, companies. If they've got lots, then they can employ more people. It's more efficient that way. The 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 cost base becomes less. So yeah. You're right to mention that because that's another, you'd say, restructure, redistribution, but it was coming anyway. Agree. 100% agree. You know, I mean, the world's innovating daily. You know, it either takes a pandemic or it doesn't. You know, things are going to change. And, you know, it's, it's, I, I can understand, I don't like to use the word boomers because, you know, sort of people get offended by it. But, um, you know, a lot of people that, you know, we used to, you know, go down to the post office, go do their banking in branch or in-house, you know, things have changed completely now. And, um, you know, for better or for worse, this is the direction that we're going. Yes. The, yeah. uh, uh, a lot of the, 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 uh, the bank branches, when the, as you said, the boomers eventually die, they'll become even more, there'll be less bank branches. There'll be, I, I, I would say particularly uh, they'll, they'll sell less newspapers. I'll, I, I feel that sort of uh, news agents are only existing because there's, there's still a significant portion of the population who buy, who, who buy that, what is it, dead tree edition of the papers. <laughs> dead tree edition. Yeah. Um, look, I mean, if there's a, there's a lot of indicators out there that are suggesting that you know a lot of the slack that pe- that businesses of well, I wouldn't say slack sorry let me rephrase um, a lot of the traditional business a lot of the traditional business that business got before the pandemic um, a lot of these businesses have moved to different ways to market themselves and uh, you know they're now getting a lot of revenue from places like the internet from from different sources where pre pandemic they wouldn't have even considered. So in terms of innovation, I mean, it's done a lot of things, which I think, as you said, were coming anyway. Another thing that is particularly uh, complaining about their, their hurt uh, during, uh, 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 during the, the pandemic and because of the Fortress Australia policy is the university sector, just because they have become so reliant on the, the international student uh, fees. And well, I'm not a big fan of the modern universities so i'm not particularly uh, sympathetic to them uh, but uh, i'll get your opinion on whether uh, that aspect of our economy is as important as the universities say it is and the governments do as well because they're they're keen to get international students back to australia but know that it's electorally unpopular when there's still a lot of australians uh, wanting to get back 
Yeah, look, I mean, I think, you know, this has, I, 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 I think the universities are getting, are copying a lot of flack in regards to this. Um, whereas I think the actual, if you're going to dish out flack to people for reliance on international students, you should be looking directly at Liberal and Labor government policies because they're the ones that have pushed the universities, you know, 20 years ago to change their business model so they can become more profitable. Um, legislation allows them to do it. So essentially, um, I, I do agree that based upon this current business model, where the universities get a large chunk of their revenue from international students, um, you know, I, I don't, I, I, obviously it's very important for them, but this is the way that, you know, the governments have successive governments, as I said, either Liberal or Labor, have directed and pushed the universities to go. So can we really blame the universities entirely? Yes, you're absolutely correct. Uh, governments do set a lot of the, the regulation and fee, fee structures uh, for uh, universities. It's a, it, it, it's, it, even though most of them in Australia are private institutions, there's, there's still lots of uh, various government regulations and decrees, uh, which is, I think, why universities themselves have, have such a bloated admins as well, which it, it contributes to a lot of the, the, the fees as well. Sorry, I, I, I said legislation. I meant to say regulation, but you, 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 you are, use the right word. But, yeah, look, I mean, this business model is not only adopted in Australia. International students are now the uh, golden, ch golden children of all universities around the world. Do you think it will be a good thing if, well, as a side effect of this pandemic, that the universities might find might be forced to be weaned off them? I think the edu I think unless taxpayers want to continually, you know, subsidise universities even further, then you know, which which I look, I'm I'm a believer of, you know, we shouldn't really, you know. Free enterprise should be allowed to to run their business however they want to with the least amount of government regulations. Um, you know, I don't believe in government getting involved in business. I think the government should stick to governing and they should let businesses run business. Um, but, you know, I, as, 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 as I mentioned before, you know, whether we like it or not, the business model of universities globally is to attract international students. And it's not only Australian universities. You know, I, I have a friend of mine here in China. His his son lives in the US. He just got it. He had he got admitted to Stanford University. You know, and he was being hunted by Harvard. He was being hunted by Stanford. Obviously, you need to you know be smart enough to get in there, but you know, obviously, you still have to pay a lot of money to actually be admitted to them. So, I mean, I think if we want to take our universities out of that global competitive arena, I don't think it's going to be good for domestic education at all. I definitely think that the deregulation is a much easier sell for governments than it would be, say, 20 years ago, given, well, as I said, uh, universities' reputations aren't what they used to be. There's a, a real focus on that, on that doing a trade is is not just a respectable career, but that's where the real money is now. You can earn six figures if you go through a, a apprenticeship as a electrician or a other other a plumber, other 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 types of which were essential services during COVID, so there definitely I would say there is a and our politicians in Australia they always go with public opinion. It could definitely be done. Yeah, look, I mean, I. I... I, 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 I can understand why people are angry because there's a lot of international students coming into universities, especially at a time during COVID when, you know, people shouldn't be travelling at all. Um, but in saying that, I'll just go back to my previous point if I can. Unfortunately, you have to be part of a global market. We can't just shut ourselves off from the international market and say, oh, well, because we don't like interna too many international students coming in, uh, we're not going to allow it to happen because at the end of the day, what's going to happen? They're just going to go elsewhere. 
And then these other universities are going to get more revenue and they're going to be able to improve their services and their education facilities a lot better because they're getting the money where we're not. Well, I, I made, I think, Australian people, uh, the, at the moment, the Australian people would be like, well, uh, just let them go to those foreign universities. We don't really care. Well, you know, they're not the, you know, if, if they, if they would like to see more of their tax dollars go to subsidized universities, then, you know, they're more entitled to, they're, they're entitled to, to, to think that way. You know, there's for every, for every position that we take, there's always a, a there's always an, an outcome, right? I just don't want my tax dollars subsidizing, you know, institutions that can be funded by the market. Uh, I put on the screen, Tim. You have a terrible echo when you start speak, speaking. I think that's coming through on your end. The feedback there. Have you got headphones that you can put in? Uh, yeah, maybe. Uh, I got. I know I got headphones. Yeah, let me just. Uh, do you mind if you just give me a second? I just. Yep, sure. Have to have a look. Obviously, there's a risk in uh, asking a guest to uh, change their their audio setup because then might make it worse there. Uh, so thanks for that feedback, uh, Roy. Roy, hopefully we can uh, fi uh, fix it. I know. Notice also in the in the chat uh, we have well formally. Uh, Beaver anti-bullying, uh, Hadran anti-bullying, he is known as now, who likes Fortress Australia and, yep, <laughs> doesn't care about uh, the universities uh, not getting as, as much money. Mark Barnes coaching is a, an account I haven't seen in the, uh, the Unshackled or Wilmsfront YouTube chats before. Uh, I'm not sure if you're a, a, a friend or a colleague or follower of uh, Andrew's, but it's good to see a, a new face there in the chat. And obviously, Margot is in the, in the, in the chat as well. She was the one who suggested uh, Andrew as a guest and, and got, us, uh, uh, got us in contact for tonight's show. It's, it's been a, a, quite a fascinating discussion and we're, we're getting into some of the, the more intricate details of our current economic situation. Mogo says, maybe maybe your mic is too close to you. I don't think so. Uh, the microphone is somewhat away from me. I'll bring back in Andrew here. Yeah, Hello? I've, got the wrong, I've got the wrong jack. Okay. Well, it seems to have gone now, the echo, for some reason. I don't know if you fixed anything there, but yeah, there's no there's no echo when I started started speaking there. Perfect. Oh, I noticed that, that there's like a, there, there's a slight picture change. I don't know. So it's one of the, in some in these technical things. So sometimes some movement that you can't explain suddenly fixes something. Yeah. Look, uh, if it, if it's fixed something, then power to it, right? <laughs> well, that's another good thing about well the fact that uh, we that that, uh, uh, that uh, a pandemic occurred uh, when we had all this technology that uh, what is it even though well a, as I keep saying I mean for Fortress Australia if you wanted to come back you'd have to go through the hotel quarantine but I can directly speak with you through the power of the internet and get your your views and opinions. Mm. Yeah, it's uh, you know, look, I yeah, it's 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 fantastic, really, really. Uh, the thank God for the internet in uh, two thousand and twenty one or two thousand and twenty as well, because I'm sure people would have been very, very bored during the pandemic when it was in its worst days without the internet. So we didn't. I mean, a, a lot of countries' internet collapsed. You know, they couldn't get bandwidth. Uh, a lot of businesses were having trouble. Um, so I think Australia's internet held up pretty well, didn't it? That was another thing that I was pleasantly surprised about that because obviously uh, the internet has been a political football in Australia for the past decade with the 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 NBN. But yes, it uh, it it surprisingly held up with everyone uh, working from home and going on to, to Zoom meetings. And but uh, obviously it was assisted by we have the. 
the ongoing 5G uh, rollout uh, as well, which is helping uh, mobile connectivity as well. And the uh, telecommunications companies, they're constantly making their own investments in new new internet technology as well. The NBN didn't turn out to be the, uh, well, it still was a, an expensive disaster, but didn't destroy the internet as we feared in Australia. Look, I, I think what a lot of people don't realise is whether you're signed up to the NBN or not, a lot of your data travels through the NBN, right? So I think, I look, I, I, I agree. Look, as I said to you before, I don't think government should get involved in any in private enterprise full stop. But um, as, a, as a redundancy, I think it's, you know, done pretty well. Now, uh, going back on to Fortress Australia again, I've probably said that. Somebody should do a counter how many times I've said, oh, 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 I've said that <laughs> to, uh, tonight. But it's, but it's, it's such an accurate... A a accurate description there well for the past 30 years as uh, globalization uh, continued in australia and there was more outsourcing uh, there are always these australian made campaigns by australian but everyone still bought the 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 the, the cheapest product uh, but it's gained much more traction of obviously over the past year uh, with well a lot of markets uh, cut off as well particularly during the uh, march 2020 when so there was so much uncertainty uh, international shipping uh, was significantly uh, delayed uh, there there was a, a lot of sh shortages not just uh, due to surges in demands but because parts couldn't come from overseas that uncertain period is is over but now we have a this uh, you you would say uh i wouldn't say mer mercantile in mer mercantile in approach from nations when it comes to the the, the vaccines but it's basically protectionist approaches when it comes to the uh, uh, the manufacture and distribution of the the vaccines i'm not going to get into the vaccine issue itself tonight but just talking about the vaccine market because we had three million vaccines that never came to australia because the the eu wanted to have those for themselves and uh, then obviously with the a lot of uh, australians demanding the the pfizer vaccine which is mrna over the astrazeneca vaccine which is made locally and it's had its issues it, Australians have learnt that we can't manufacture mRNA vaccines here. We have to rely on the US and, and Europe, which have shown how how unreli unreliable relying on them is at the moment. And we had the Victorian government announce on Tuesday that they were going to invest $50 million in an RM RMNA vaccine facility. Now, I'm just using this as an, an example that... This uh, th this type of vaccine protectionism coming from Europe that has I, I would say further uh, increased the the demands that Australia become more self sufficient. Now, obviously, no na no nation can produce every uh, can produce everything uh, it needs locally. Autarky, that's called. Uh, but certainly, we've said goodbye to a lot of industries mainly due to overregulation that uh, could have uh, stayed do you think it's wise for australia to re-establish its indus industries i'm talking about through free market uh, uh, free market means because a lot of companies now are, are wanting to uh, make sure that uh, they have a uh, they have a steady local supply as well look the it's a very loaded question because there's a lot of factors that are that, that you know play into that into that consideration. Um, I guess if I'll address it in a few different parts. So yeah, yeah, because I sort of just uh, dumped it all on you. Uh, yeah, it's uh, just. Uh, but, but look, I, I I I understand your question, and you know, um, I I I think the first thing that has to happen is it has to start with legislation and regulation. You know, that's that's the first thing that needs to happen. Like, um, I think as I mentioned to you before, you know, the biggest two problems in Australia right now 
uh, that unions want to pay everyone a billion dollars an hour, number one. And number two, we don't have cheap energy. So if you want to manufacture something, you've got two of the biggest hindrances out there. You've got to pay wages that are way too high compared to your competitors overseas. And then on top of that, you've got energy costs that are sky high. But we so, could have... <laughs> Well, I, I don't see the political will of either party to actually do it now, especially now that, you know, everyone's talking about climate change and green energy and, you know, which is pretty much a pipe dream at this point in time with the current technology that we have. You know, we need baseload power. That's what we need. We need cheap baseload power. If we want to start manufacturing again in Australia, we need cheap baseload power. There's no ifs or buts about it. And until yeah. Australian voters make it an issue and push both sides of government to start this thing up again, it's not going to happen. It's just a pipe dream. The reason so, why we have cheap power, government just got out of the way. Well, look, energy, uh, look, uh, look, let me, let me uh, tell you, l let me put something into perspective maybe. My electricity bill in China is three times cheaper than it is in Australia for the same period of time. And and we're getting Australian coal to power these, you know, power generation stations. So that's just a comparison for yourself and your viewers. Um, and for companies, it's even worse. You know, we can't compete. You know, we have to address the competition issue through government before any of this can happen. And we also, even though climate change politics has interfered with the, the energy market, we also have what is it, a lot of the en energy companies engaging in this what is it, woke capitalism, wanting to uh, get away from baseload power themselves, such as AGL and the, the big banks not uh, financing new uh, coal projects. We did have, in terms of... Uh, uh, electoral factors, the the mini, you'd call it mini uh, revolts uh, in the, the 2019 federal election with the uh, uh, regional Queensland uh, voting strongly against the, the Labor Party, which was uh, hinting that they wanted to, 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 to not approve the Adani coal mine and had their ambitious 50% uh, renewable energy target. Look, um, I'm not a fan of green energy whatsoever uh and you know for yourself and your viewers i'd ask the question who is the number one investor in green energy globally what sector i'll tell you it's the oil and gas sector so essentially and it's bec it's because of the, of the politics of it all right so look I've, i'm very i've been very bullish on oil for a very long time i own shares in exxon mobil i bought it you know, 12 months ago during the pandemic when it was $30, it's now 60 something or $56. I think it closed out yesterday. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's buying oil and gas now as a hedge because you've, you're lot, you're basically profiting off the fossil fuels that are going to power the world for the next 20 years. And at the same time, um, a lot of their profits are being reinvested into green energy, but it's funny the CEO of, uh, Exxon Mobil, uh, I think his name's Darren Woods, I think it is. He came out and he said, look, the reality is that whatever the government is subsidising now, this is not going to be the green energy, energy solution that we're going to be using in 20 years' time. And the reality is, is that, look, you know, look, a lot of people are dirty in China, right, for so many reasons, right? And I don't want to get into it because I'm obviously here. But, you know, I say power to them, right? You know, the Australian yeah. government's stupid enough to subsidise green energy right, where all the solar panels are made in China. 60% of the world's solar panels are made in China and the Australian government wants to subsidise solar panels which are coming from China. So even if an Australian company wanted to start manufacturing solar panels, they wouldn't even be able to compete with a company in China because labour costs and the, en and the energy cost input. So, you know, I think the government's got a lot of answering to do when it comes to this to these ridiculous regulations and legislation and this international pressure that's coming from green e for, for green energy. And, you know, I made the point to some total lefty lunatic the other day. 
I said to them, I said, you go out and protest on the street for green energy and, you know, save the planet like your, like your favorite person, Greta. And um, I just want to ask you a question. I said, where do 40% of Australian government tax receipts come from? Oh, I don't know. It comes from the, the mining sector. So if they like their hospitals and they like their roads and they like, you know, the public services that the government provide, well, you can't be going out protesting every week to totally change the, the balance of the Australian economy because it's going to end in complete financial ruin. I don't need to explain <laughs> this audience the uh, illogical uh, political positions of the uh, the climate left pro pro protesters. I mean, they they have countless contradictions. You just listed one of them. Yeah, I mean, look, it's just I, I think. Uh, sorry, going going back to your point, what was your what, what what was your question again? Sorry, I got sidetracked with the a, a Australian self sufficiency is. Oh yes, yes, yes. Sorry, look, I. I you, you've answered it quite significantly, saying that if we want our industries back, need cheap baseload power, which is not happening at the moment. Yeah, and you know that's that's the main concern. I mean, if you if you think about it, right? Imagine you're, you're a company wanting to invest in Australia in some form of manufacturing, and you know you're answerable to shareholders, right? So. You're okay. We, we, we can set up manufacturing in Australia, but our energy input, our labor costs, the regulations ridiculous. Of course, they're going to go set up in Indonesia or India. You know, it, it doesn't make any financial or economic sense for them to do it in Australia. So, as a, it all comes back to regulation and the way that the government approaches energy policy and labor markets. Another is uh, for Australian companies is uh, compulsory superannuation, which is uh, currently at 9.5%. The Morrison government, uh, they've decided that they're going to allow the, the rise to 10%, uh, which is obviously companies can't take it directly out of take-home wages, uh, but certainly can redistribute wages over time now there's it's become a, a huge uh, uh political football as well superannuation because there there are those union dominated industry super funds so obviously labor loves the superannuation industry and but it's it's another over regulated uh, monstrosity that it's uh, become uh, what's your view on uh, the 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 super market in australia because it's it's a pretty unique one throughout the world look i i i think that the government um definitely if if they want to make people contribute to super it should be diversified a lot more i was on i'm a couple i think about a year and a half ago i was talking to ross greenwood on 2gb and um i said to him i said look i said the sad thing is that over 50% or most, I think over 70%, sorry, of all superannuation funds are heavily linked to equity market. And I said to, I said to Ross, I said, if the Australian stock market collapses or if it crashes, people are going to lose a lot of their life savings overnight. So, I, I, and in saying that, I think superannuation does have value in the sense that for myself, I'd rather manage superannuation myself. You know, I, I mean, I'm in the financial industry, so I understand that. But for your average person that wants to put away a certain amount of money for their retirement, I don't see a problem with it. I think it's more in the way it's regulated and then the way it's run. But in saying that, it's like anything. You get too big and all of a sudden, you know, you've got uh, forces at play that don't really do the best for people's money. Yeah, you're exactly right. So, uh, uh, yeah, I've often thought that it'd probably be safer to uh, just put it in a a bank uh, a, a bank term deposit. You'd probably get more money over time. But and also the fact that well, it, it's basically delegated, well, oh, compulsory uh, delegated investing of 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 your money. 
because it goes to these uh, super funds who make all the decisions and what is it, their boards get paid, what is it, uh, uh, 400000 uh, 400,000 each a year to invest your money. Yeah, I mean, uh, and look, to be honest, the returns aren't even that good. Let's be brutally honest here. The, the, the returns aren't that good. All the superannuation returns that people are getting are totally dependent on equity markets. And, you know, with quantitative easing now, I mean, they're doing very well because everyone's all these markets around the world are being pumped up completely. Um, I think in America they call it 401ks, right? It's very similar to our superannuation scheme here. But, um, you know, with equity markets at all-time highs, it's happy days at the moment, and I think it is a political football, but I think at the moment it's sort of pushed to one side because things are going very well in equity markets. But once the once markets turn, I think you're going to see this issue really rear its head in Australia again. Because people are going to have twenty suffer 20, 30% losses. And, um, you know, that's a lot of their life savings that they're not going to be able to recover for at least five or 10 years. Now, moving on, your, your favorite at the moment and favorite market, and that's the, the cryptocurrency market. Because Bitcoin, well, Bitcoin, which is the main cryptocurrency, is just surged and i would argue that's because of all the qe that all <laughs> most central banks around the world have been engaging in and it's called uh, called by a lot of people digital gold even though it is not tied to a physical product like uh, gold is and because it it, it does uh, not uh, there's only a limited number of bitcoins in the world this is why it surges while more and more money is created 100 percent. and uh you know right now i think i mentioned this to you before we came on the other night or something uh the reason i was actually against cryptocurrency up until even a year ago i was against it um and it wasn't for the reason that people would think that the reason that I was against it is I was worried that the government could come in and regulate the whole industry. And if they did that, that would deal a significant blow to the market. However, ever since COVID, what's happened is with all this quantitative easing out there, they need another, the banks and the hedge funds, they need another sector to put all this cash into. Otherwise, you're going to see inflation go to crazy levels in all other sectors. I mean, inflation is already running hot in the stock market. It's running hot in the property market. Um, and, you know, they needed to allocate a certain amount of cash to another sector to keep everything in equilibrium. And that's why cryptocurrency has gone mainstream. I mean, in the last six months, you've seen Visa take it on, MasterCard's taken it on. Uh, BMW has done a deal with VET, which is another cryptocurrency. So you've got all these global uh, organizations now getting on board with cryptocurrency now the more global entities that actually take it on board the less chance the government have to regulate and shut it down so mm -hmm. that's why i think it's got to the point now where we're at critical mass um in in describing the fact that the government can't shut it down anymore so that being said i'm very very bullish on cryptocurrency I know that there's more and more uh, Bitcoin bears emerging who say that it's all going to uh, collapse soon. And what is it? The 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 founder of of Bitcoin, his name escapes me. It's that Japanese name you Nakamoto. Yeah, that uh, his identity is going to be revealed, and it's going to show what a a, a massive a, a massive ride it, it it all was there's always uh, uh, these sorts of uh, conspiracy theorists uh, doubtists on on everything uh, but yeah I, I agree with you that i just don't see yeah the government has basically failed in its attempts uh, it's a good failure to regulate it because it has well it's decentralized nature makes it impossible and well there's there's multiple different crypto uh, cryptocurrencies now not just uh, bitcoin and it it has seemed to have like there there hasn't been this massive 
as people thought, cyber hacks of uh, currencies, that sort of thing. It's remained completely secure. Yeah, look, uh, you know, it's it's really fun. I've, I, I remember having a conversation uh, with, with a few commentators that, you know, were totally against Bitcoin. Um, you know, people were spruiking gold and silver as, as, as alternatives. Um, you know, one of these guys was actually John Adams, but anyway, that's a completely another story. But, um, you know, he was saying how you should buy gold and silver. And, you know, and I said to him, I said, well, okay, so I don't care about your opinion. I said, what I want to know is if I bought gold and silver in 2011 at the peak of the market, how much money would I, would I have made today in 2021? This is 10 years down the track, right? The answer is you wouldn't have made any money. You would have lost money. You would have lost money. Now, I appreciate that gold and silver have intrinsic value. That's, that's, that's not what's being disputed. What I like about cryptocurrency is what you mentioned. It's the fact that there's a finite amount. They could find another million, a million ounces of gold in Africa tomorrow. And all of a sudden, the supply would increase. And I think in a time where you've got, as you mentioned, you've got, you know, the US government going, the Federal Reserve just going into lunatic mode when it comes to quantitative easing. Uh, people are looking for assets that have scarcity. And what a lot of people don't understand about Bitcoin is that it has digital scarcity. That, that was the equation that actually gave it value in the first instance. If you don't have scarcity, you don't have value, you know. Um, and uh, with this loose economic policy and monetary policy that governments are running at the moment, there is there is nothing in my mind that will stop Bitcoin hitting a million dollars in five or ten years. Yeah, it's uh, obviously uh, go down time because there are always these these sorts of volatile. Periods, uh, but just to give you a, a personal an anecdote. Uh, when I wanted to purchase a, a Gab Pro membership, was it uh, two years ago? They only accept crypto because they've been de deplatformed by Visa, Mastercard. So I went up through the process of uh, converting Australian dollars to Bitcoin and paying them that way. And I had a bit left over, and there was no way to convert it back to Australian dollars. And then I, I checked in recently because, well, I saw all the reports of Bitcoin surging to see what my balance was worth now. And I was like, I won't say the amount, but I was just like, whoa, it's gone up to, to, to that much. I could buy something nice with that. And that was just left oh. over from my purchase. And you know what? And the reason for it is going to your point. Visa and MasterCard would now allow you to get an account on Gab Pro with their, with their, with their cryptocurrency option. So because it's become so mainstream now, um, you know, honestly, Tim, there are so many hedge funds and banks that have gone heavily into cryptocurrency. Now, just to give you an example, Bitcoin is now valued at, I think, $1.1 trillion. That's the market cap of Bitcoin. That is more than the four largest US banks combined. More. Dogecoin, that, that meme coin, which Elon Musk is getting behind, um, which started as a joke, mind you, when that hit 37 cents, the market capitalization of Dogecoin was actually more than Ford Motor Company. And that was over $40 billion. So, you know, the amounts of money that are being plowed into this sector are just astronomical. And as, as I mentioned before, as long as governments continue this quantitative easing, especially the US, the, the, the Federal Reserve, uh, they're going to continue to inflate these markets. Because if you have more debt, which is what quantitative mm -hmm. easing essentially is, you need to offset that debt. How do you offset it? Inflate asset prices. And that's th th this is the central bank's game. That's what they're doing. Okay, we will we'll issue more debt. You're on the hook. But we're going to offset that by increasing asset prices. So the markets are going to the moon. And we haven't even started yet. We haven't, we haven't even started yet. Now, we've spoken mainly tonight about the Australian economic situation and potential future outlook forecasting, but uh, there is 
the 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 rest of the world in terms of or well, its economic activity uh they they've had uh, they've had the the european nations and and north america uh much more prolonged snaps back into lockdown than australian uh cities have experienced bar melbourne in in 2020 some uh, some of these governments have their their own support schemes the uk ones called uh, called the furlough and that some don't have any type of uh, uh business support schemes and then we've got the the massive uh, covid surge going on uh in india is is the the situation in those those countries uh, economic situations is it would you say they're similar to australia or does the 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 mixture of lockdown uh, lockdowns from the government and then the 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 way they impose regulate that have an effect I've muddled that question, but yeah, I, 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 that's all right. Look, I, I, I sort yeah. of got the gist of what you're saying. Um, look, my my major concern is that is 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 the United States economy. The U.S. economy is not good by any metric. Manufacturing jobs are down. Inflation's going through the roof. Um, they're issuing huge amounts of debt. Do you know because of coronavirus, right? They're issuing, they've done more quantitative easing this time than QE1, 2, and 3 combined. It's really funny, right? You've got this situation that a lot of people can't understand. It's that the economy is down here and the stock market's at record highs, right? And again, I think people are like, oh, you know, that's why a lot of people are like, oh, the market's going to collapse. Everything's going to go down. You know, you should sell, sell, sell you know, get your money into cash. Um, no, you know, and I think what a lot of people need to understand is look back at 2008, same thing happened. The economy went to went to crap and the market started to go on this massive bull run. And look, it's not a good thing um, because eventually the chickens will come home to roost. And what I mean by that is that it's not sustainable. Um, in stock markets now have reached this euphoric, it's, there's, there's just mass euphoria in the whole market, right? And it's basically new high every day, new high every day, new high every day. And it's totally dependent. No one cares about economic data anymore. All they care about is, is the federal reserve continuing to print those billions of dollars every day? That's all people care about. So I think I've gone a bit off topic with your question, but, um, I think, you know, there is definitely going to be a problem down the line uh, economically, but I think Australia's policies have been a lot more measured. Um, our response has been measured and we haven't gone to this unlimited QE situation like that's happened in Europe and North America. Um, so I think that, you know, obviously the world is globalised now. So what happens in the US and Europe will definitely affect Australia. But I think that we're going to weather the storm a lot better when things do turn quite bad. And I think that should give Australians a lot of confidence. Um, we don't have the levels of debt that the US and Europe have. Um, it's still manageable. And just to give your viewers some understanding of what matters in, in markets, um, because there's so much information out there and, you know, people just, you know, there's just too much to digest. So. The reason that I say stock market, the stock market and the housing market are going to continue to rise is because central banks are now controlling bond yields. They've, they've initiated what's called yield curve control. So what that, what that basically means is that the central banks around the world have said, we're going to keep interest rates at this level for a certain period of time, which are really low. So when you keep interest rates artificially low for a very long period of time, that promotes economic growth. It promotes spending because people can borrow money and invest it and make a lot more money. Now, the problem is it's like an elastic band. If you keep interest rates low, 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 low for too long, and then eventually the government, the central bank say, no, nah, you know, we're not doing this anymore, which is going to happen, then all of a sudden you've got the opposite effect where it snaps back. So the question we're asking is how bad is the snap, that snap back going to be when it happens? If interest rates do go up and they go up quite quickly because they've done quantitative easing for too long, then I think we're going to see some problems because 
when you're not getting wage growth, but then you've got someone servicing their home loan, which is $800,000, and they're now paying double the amount of interest on it, they're going to have a big problem with that. Um, and the same in the stock market. You know, you've got – in the stock market now, you've got more leveraged positions than ever before in history. People are borrowing money to play the stock market. So when interest rates rise, it is going to create some issue. But I do think Australia is much better insulated to handle this. But albeit being in a globalised economy, we will feel some of that negative pressure that will that, that definitely is going to occur at some stage. Uh, Peter Sh <laughs> An economist who he, he's been predicting uh, economic doom in the the United States for for, for many years. Uh, he's what is he, he's he realizes it himself. He's called he's he's called a a bear broken clock because he's right occasionally when the market goes down. But he says the real crash will happen when the the uh, the U.S. dollar. Is is no longer the 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 well, the, the standard global currency for the the United States. Uh, what you you talked about the 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 QE happening over in the the US and the fact that their economy is not great is is that a possibility that the US dollar could not it could no longer become the global reserve currency and trigger a real crash of the US as Peter Schiff calls it. Okay, well, if the U.S. military ceases to exist tomorrow, there's probably a good chance that will happen. Okay. <laughs> Meaning, right, is that the U.S. Is, a glo is the global reserve currency for a reason, right? If you want to buy oil, you've got to pay in dollars. If you want to buy minerals, iron ore, gold, silver, copper, uranium, uh, people only accept dollars vis-a-vis -vis the U.S. military, you know? So it it does remind me of a situation where you go back to the fall of the roman empire where you know their finances got so bad that they couldn't even afford to pay their troops and the troops started to leave and started fighting independently and that was what sort of capitulated rome in in in, in its early capitulation um but i think we're in a different time now nevertheless look if this quantitative easing continues at this ridiculous rate in the united states um Look, the US dollar is definitely going to decline further. I mean, I've been long Australian dollars since it was about 60-something cents. I think it's around 76 today against the US dollar. If you have a look what happened in 2008 to 2011, that's when the Australian dollar went over the US dollar's value, it went to 110. I think the high was 110.87 in 2011. So I'm predicting that, that, that you know, that is going to happen again. Um, right now, the Federal Reserve's gain is keep 10 year keep bond yields low keep the us dollar suppressed and keep issuing more debt um and it's great for an economic recovery but the chickens come home to roost and the problem i have with a lot of these doomsters right it's that if i stand outside your house tim and i say there's going to be a car accident wait an hour mm. you say where's the car accident oh tim i'm just gonna come stand there for a week yeah it's gonna come yeah another month another year five years when it finally comes the person that said that isn't correct even though they've said that it's gonna happen it's like you, you can't say oh there's you know it's gonna be doom and gloom like rubini like peter schiff like john adams like martin north they keep spruiking the same stuff over and over again and when it finally happens they're like oh i told you so you know, that's that's not really predicting anything in, in my mind. Um, I believe that because of Keynesian economics, you have these booms and busts, more so than an Austrian model. I, I accept that, and, you know, that is, that is true. However, you know, um, we are at a time right now where debt is what fuels OECD countries. You know, debt is the vehicle that allows economic growth. So we're sort of stuck in this vicious cycle where add more debt, get more growth, add more debt, get more growth. Um, and you're right, the chickens will come home to roost eventually and we're going to have another problem. Question is, how bad will it be? And, you know, flip, flip a coin. If, 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 if that makes sense. 
Yes, it does. <laughs> I've thoroughly enjoyed your uh, analysis and expertise tonight, uh, Andrew. Uh, it's been interesting to hear. Uh, they're not, I wouldn't say they're unique insights, but uh, they're the way you explain it, 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 it certainly, well, it's such a simple explanation, but it's something that I haven't heard before because, well, as as I said in my, my introduction, I've heard a lot of these sort of uh, doom predictions before, So, uh, but it's a lot more complicated, uh, but uh, there, there is uh, our economic situation, but uh, there is uh, simple and logical explanations for why things are still stable is the word to use. Hmm. Yeah, look, I, I, I mean, I, I think just on a final note for your viewers, I mean, it's not a time to panic. Um, there's a lot of people out there that will say, oh, you know, everything's going to collapse, everything's going to collapse. Cycles happen all the time. You know, we live, in, we live in, a, in a world that is based on cycles. There are booms and busts, but, you know, don't let these people that have horrible track records advise you to make crazy decisions because they tell you that, you know, the world's going to collapse. You know, um, we always progress. We always move forward. And uh, I think that, yeah, I think, I think that, um, you know, whilst uncertain, uh, we're headed in the right direction, especially in Australia. Well, yeah, hopefully you can make it back sometime soon. Uh, we don't know when Fortress Australia is going to uh, moderately reopen, well, at least to Australians who uh, are, are, are overseas. I'm not sure if you've uh, may if you if it's been on your mind to to come back eventually. Yeah, look, I I, def I definitely will come back at some stage. But if I come back now, the Australian government won't let me leave. It's like it's it's like Hotel Australia. You can check in any time you like, but you can never leave. <laughs> But you could actually go from China to another country legally. Yeah, I mean, I, I can I can travel, but I've got to do quarantine. So, no, I, mean, I uh, do all countries because uh, every country is different when it comes to like quarantining of arrivals. But no nation has the 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 the, the strict controls that Australia does. Uh, look, I th I think. Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, I mean Australia is really a standout in regard to those controls. Um, but a lot of countries aren't admitting certain people at the moment. Um, but uh, look, hopefully things get better because I haven't travelled for a year and a half thereabouts since since I came back from Europe on the first of February last year. So yeah, it's been almost a year and a half now. So I'm definitely looking forward to travel again. You know, I got family in Australia and Hong Kong, and you know people around in the US as well. So I'd like to travel, but yeah, just at this time, it's, it is what it is. You know, we've just got to ride it out the best we can and um, hope that things get better soon. There has been a, uh, the two-way Trans-Tasman bubble open with New Zealand this week. Uh, New Zealand doesn't ban its citizens from international travel. So an Australian <laughs> would travel to New Zealand and then go... Uh, go overseas, but you'd be an Australian fugitive if you ever decided to to come back. You'd have to please explain why you uh, left uh, left Australia to go overseas, and if it's not satisfactory, or well, you'd get a fine, or maybe even prison. Well, the, the Australian government have already said that um, you know you may not be able to come back straight away because they've got quotas as to the amount of people that can come back every every week. They call uh, they they term them uh, caps, uh, but given that uh, what is it? A lot of our premiers lock down a, a city if there's an outbreak from hotel quarantine. That's another thing. There's not much sympathy for these returning Australians either. Yeah, I mean, you know, I I'm I'm fortunate in the sense that you know I never really tried to come back home. I didn't have to, but you know, there's a lot of Australians out there doing it quite tough at the moment. Um, you know, especially throughout Europe and, you know, other countries where there's not as much flight connectivity. Um, so I do feel for them, you know, it's really, it's probably very, very tough. Um, 
you know, but at the same time, I mean, logistically, it's very hard to get all these people. I think there's 30,000 Australians outside the country. So uh, I think logistically. I'm back. Sorry, you just broke up for a second. I couldn't. They're, they're, they're just the ones who want to come back, I think, that have registered oh. with the expression of okay. interest. Back. There's probably way more. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I haven't I've really kept up with that data, but, um, yeah, I could only imagine it would be very hard for them. Well, hopefully I can see you one day, but in the meantime, uh, all the best. And, yeah, I've thoroughly enjoyed your, your expertise and so has the audience. Pleasure, my friends. And uh, come back to Australia. We'll definitely catch up. Take care. You too. Thank you, Tim. Thanks for tuning in to Wilmsfront. Visit timwilms.com or Rational Rise TV to view the archive of episodes. And keep visiting theunshackled.net to view all our shows. And to keep up with the latest real news and analysis.